Hello and a very warm welcome to the latest edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. Now, my guest today is quite simply one of the most successful film actors here in Germany. And here he is in person, Mario Adolf. Thank you very, very much for joining us today here on Talking Germany. It's a great pleasure for me. Now, Mario Adolf has been in acting for six decades. In his early days, he was best known for his portrayals of bad guys, of villains, some of them absolutely remarkable roles. Later, he appeared in a whole series of what you might call arthouse movies, the most outstanding of which was probably the Oscar-winning adaptation of the Gunter Grass novel The Tin Drum. Now, I should add that Mario Adolf is also a very accomplished entertainer, author and conversationalist, so it's great to have him here on the show. Thank you. Mario Adolf, um, I, I looked on a, on a well-known internet site and I saw that they listed that you have played in 208 movies, yeah? I'm sure you can't remember all of them, but the, no. first, question I, <laughs> the first question I have for you, can you remember the first time you ever went to the movies as a yes. boy? Yes. You can. Tell me. Yes, I think that was in the 30s, mm -hmm. around... 36 or 7, or I was about 6 or 7 years old, I think. And it was a film, a movie with Spencer Tracy. Uh -huh. and, and I forgot the title. Uh -huh. It is where you played a sailor who, who, who died. A very famous, famous film. It oh, was called... Uh -huh. I knew the title. It, it, the, the, the title is, I think, the, the name of the boy. Uh-huh. Yes. And it made a big impression on you. Big one, yes. I cried. You cried? Yes, it was mm -hmm. such a sad story at the end. Mm -hmm. And I always, for that, I, I loved Spencer Tracy. And if I'm asked, uh, you ha do you have any um, idol, you know, or somebody you, you really admire? Mm -hmm. um, I'm always said, uh, yes, but the most admired actor in, in my life mm -hmm. was Spencer Tracy. Oh, wonderful. And tell me this, what, what was the difference between going to the movies back then and going to the movies now? Is it the same thing or is it a different world? Well, uh, certainly this is not, uh, I, I don't remember very much, you know, mm -hmm. how I know, I remember where the cinema was, how what it was like, you know, and uh, I, I, I remember even the chairs, the, 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 the clapping of, you know, of the, of the wooden chairs and so, uh, and it, it was, uh, and you had to have uh, tickets, number tickets with the, with the seat numbers, you yeah. know. So yeah. it's not like, today you go to a cinema, you know, and you have to find a place. This was at the time, even after the war, I remember that you have to have, you know, tickets you know, with the seats, you know. Yeah. For our English-speaking audience, I think the film that most people would think of first when they think of you and your work is The Tin Drum, the adaptation yes, of yes. the Gunter Grass novel, which yes. won the Oscar. Um, D that movie was about the period that you're talking about, the period of your childhood, yeah? Yes. When you were making that movie, was, did, did, did that bring up memories for you of that period? Oh, yes, I think it, it was quite uh, important, you know. Uh, I, naturally, I knew more about life at the time, about the atmosphere, about fear. Fear. Yes, and about hunger. Mm. And these are these strong, things, the yeah. strong emotions and feelings, yes. fear and yes. hunger. The, mo the two most important emotions, you know. Did you know hunger yourself in that sense? Oh, yes. Because oh, yes. this you... is something, in my life, I've been too privileged. I've never known hunger in that yes. sense. Yes, yes. Hunger was a very important thing uh, during the war or even more after the war. Because during the war, you know, uh, it, it was rather organised what you got, you know, to, uh, to live on, you know. But um, after the war, there was nothing. And there you really uh, felt hunger. Mm. And the most funny thing even is that the most hunger I ever experienced was when I studied in Switzerland. This was the interesting thing because when you went after the war to somebody, a friend or a family, they always ask you, you hungry? Have you eaten? Take an egg, take a piece of bread and so forth, you know. This would not happen to you in Switzerland because they didn't know. 
Mm-hmm. It was not their fault mm-hmm. because they didn't have this kind of solidarity. Yeah. You know? That's a fascinating story. I didn't think this is where we're going to begin today. I didn't think that hunger and fear would be yes. where we were going and to fear begin. fear was the bombing, you know. The was, bombing. OK, yes. we'll talk a little bit more about that very shortly. You've had your first impressions there from Mario Adolf. Here is more. Mario Adolf, a star who says he's had a lot of luck in life. Few actors can look back on a career as long and successful as his. Via, via. Vieni via di qui. An exhibition on his life at Berlin's Academy of the Arts in 2012 testified to that with material from his private archive, which he donated to the Academy. Photographs and documents related to over 200 roles in movies, television, and on stage. To top it off, the actor is also a successful book author and entertainer. Adar played in Hollywood westerns and in spaghetti westerns. Mario Adolf's path to stardom didn't seem inevitable. He was born out of wedlock in Zurich in 1930. His mother moved with him to Mayen in Germany's Eiffel region and worked day and night as a seamstress to survive. Financial straits forced her to place him in an orphanage for a few years. Only once in his life did he meet his father, a married surgeon from southern Italy. Mario Adolf lived in Rome for almost 40 years, trying to be more Italian than the Italians and seeking a homeland and an identity. But Italy wasn't the perfect match he hoped for. In 2004, he moved away from Rome. Monique Fay has been his life partner for more than 40 years and his wife since 1985. The couple spend most of their time in Paris and Munich. The actor runs into fans wherever he travels. And today, he's our guest on Talking Germany, Mario Adolf. Mario Adolf, we were talking about your childhood. We were talking about uh, a really tough time. You were talking about hunger and fear. In, during your childhood, when was the first moment when you thought, I want to be an actor? Well, um, I didn't know that I would be an actor or become an actor uh, very early, as some actors do. Mm-hmm. When they were young, they already played and then in staged plays and in high school and so yeah, I never did. I never. Uh-huh. I only n- remember that I realized that our um, uh, that we learned in school was not very good during the war, after the war. So I, I, I knew I have to go to university to to do something. I didn't know what, actually. I only not, I wanted to know more, you know. And then I got in touch with the uh, with the with student in the theater group and there I started first as a uh, designer you know for costumes and sets and so forth and and then I, I one day one day I saw uh, one of my colleagues and it was so really bad that uh, that, that I can do too <laughs> and and, 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 uh, and then I, 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 I proposed you know to give me a small part a year later I played a big part already and mm-hmm. then I went to Zurich mm-hmm. to university and I still didn't think about, you know, becoming an actor, but uh, I got in touch with the professional theatre in Zurich, mm-hmm. and there I started, uh, you know, as an extra and as a, and as an um, assistant director, and then I went to Munich, and there I, I wanted to go still to university and, and finish my studies there, but um, then um, looking for a, a room, I passed by the uh, acting school, the academy Mm -hmm. in Munich, Mm -hmm. and I just, you know, curious, I entered, (laughs) and they said, oh, that's too late for this year, don't come back next year. But as you hear, come on, fill out this form and the form. And I did. And I went back to my hometown, 
and I was working at the time, you know, to earn money on construction. And I, and I saw my mother, you know, with a letter in the hand and said, and I climbed down and she said, what is this? And she said, said, what? She said, this is a letter that you have to go to the academy, you know, as, in the, as a hearing, as, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, why didn't you tell me? And I said, I forgot. I oh. had forgot. Oh. I had forgotten. Mm -hmm. And I went there and uh, they took me. Okay. Yeah. And then you, you began acting on stage. You were in yes. theatre initially and yes. then you went into cinema. And I'd like to talk to you about, we had it in the report just there, yeah? Yes. Uh, the movie, uh, I'm trying to remember the year now, 1957, I think, Nights yes. When the Devil Came. Yeah, it, that it, was the your... English title was The Devil Strikes at Night. Okay. Only just if you want yeah. to. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that movie is a, that is a remarkable movie. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, at the time, this was a very um, popular and very famous uh, series in a, on, a, on a magazine. Mm -hmm. The Bunte Münchner or something like okay, that. So a popular yeah. magazine yeah. in Munich. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there was this uh, character, a real character, Bruno Lütke, who had killed about over, maybe over 100 people. As a sex, sex uh, serial. He was a serial sex killer. Yes. In between 1924 and 44. Yeah. And uh, at, the, at first, I, I, when I was offered the part, uh, I, I, I met uh, Robert Siotmak, the director. And it was very, a very funny story that um, uh, a friend of mine, a scriptwriter, he said, to, I want you to, you know, to, to know uh, Robert Siotmak. He is preparing this film. And I said, Oh, to do this film? He said, Yes. When, and when, uh, when, and at the theatre, I came late for the appointment because the very night I had played in the Rainmaker, the the funny part of Jimmy, when I had a, 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 a strap, a muscle. Uh, what, what? You'd, you'd pulled a muscle. You pulled a muscle, mm -hmm. yes. And I and I, I walked in, you know, with a walking stick, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and he said and and he said, "Schauen Sie mal bitte, do an evil look at me," he said, you know, and I said. This, you know. <laughs> he said, no, this is not evil. More, do more. And he said, no, this is not good. Mm -hmm. This is evil, he said. Yeah. And he two, pulled off his, his glasses and he looked at me with his big eyes, you know, and, and then it was it. And, and I turned around and, and, and then he said, what have you done to your leg? I said, I pulled a muscle. And what I didn't know, he was what we, what we call a healer. He was somebody who had a, a, a kind of a, a obsession, you know, mm -hmm. that he could heal people, you know. Mm -hmm. He was a doc like a doctor. And he took me to his hotel and, uh, and he said, pants down and so on. And I, was, <laughs> I said, what is this now? And, uh, and he took these sprays that you know, today we use for football and, so yeah. on, and soccer, you know. And he did this and he said, these doctors, they don't know anything. And, and he said, and no walk. Still hurts? He said, no, I lied. <laughs> and, uh, and then we came back to the, 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 the bar, we were all with all his friends and so on. And then he said, that is my devil. Look at him, how mean he, mean he can look. Wow. That was very funny. I only got and, you, and, you, and in the movie, you did look very, very mean indeed. Yes, yeah. it was. It was. was I, it and, and, and I remember that I didn't want to play the part. In, in, and I, in my contract, I, I had written, you know, my, that in the next following picture of the same company, I had to play a sympathetic, a, a, a positive character. Okay. And let's move forward in your career yeah. later into the 70s, 80s, where well, you played in art house movies, Volker Schlöndorf, Rainer Werner Fassbinder. Yes. That was a very different world. Yes. What did that mean to you? Well, for me it was when I lived in Italy at the time for many years. And then uh, all the old directors, you know, uh, died or were very old. Mm. And then uh, the German, what we call the new German cinema was born, you know, and, and many actors, known actors, they refused to work with these young directors who didn't know anything, their opinion. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I have to work with them. That's the future. And, uh, and I was there and I said, here I am. I'm ready to work with you. Mm -hmm. 
And you played in some remarkable movies, Schlundorf movies, the, the Fassbinder, Lola, great yeah. movie, yeah. Then, and I want you to tell me this story, you were, you were close to working for Francis Ford Coppola in The Godfather, one of my favourite movies. Yeah. Tell me the story, it's a remarkable story. Well, yes, well, he, um, <clears throat> uh, I met uh, Coppola in Rome and um, he asked me uh, if I had read the script, the, 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 the book, mm -hmm. the novel. Mario the, Puzo. Puzo's, Puzo's, mm -hmm. yeah. I said, yes, and I've even read the, the, the shooting script. The script. No, nobody knows that. I said, well, I've written it. I've read it, you know. Mm -hmm. He said, how? Who did it give to you? Who did, who did it give to you? I said, I won't tell. <laughs> did you find any part in the novel or in the script that you would like to play? I said, yes. And which part? He said, Sonny Corleone, the oh. oldest son of uh, Marlon Brando. Uh oh. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Well, there we have already cast uh, James Kahn. He said, James Kahn? He's a red hair. He's, a, he's, not, he's not a son of, of Marlon Brando. Look at me. I'm, I'm a son of Marlon Brando. I said, well, um, he's already cast, and uh, I must say he has the right accent. I said, the right accent, the right accents you can learn, I hope. Uh, so, is there any other part in the book? There are many parts, many characters in the book. Any other part you would like to play? I said, no. Well, then that, that was that it. That was that. No regrets, yeah? <laughs> I suppose the first question is, did, was that role written specifically for you? Which one? The uh, Nino, here, in the film. Yes, well, in a way, because we were on, working on another film, the actress, the leading actress died, mm -hmm. and in, within three weeks, uh, the director, the woman director, mm -hmm. Lola Randall, she wrote uh, a story like that, and she said, she said would you like to, uh, to play the... Oh. the uh, to work with me again. Yeah, yeah. I said, yes. Would you do this part I, I've written? I haven't. And I said, yes, without having read, read it, you know, because I knew her situation. She was in a shock, you know, uh, after the death of this actress. And then she did, she had to do something. And she just in, in, in within three weeks, she wrote this uh, script and we did it in 13 days. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the important, uh ideas, one of the important premises in the film is that the two characters, you and the young uh, woman, can ask each other any question that you want, yeah? Uh, if somebody were to ask you from your long life, and you have lived life to the full, what have you learnt about life? What would you say? What I learned about life? Yeah, it's a big question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Just go on. Just go, go on. on. Yes. Yeah? Look forward, not back, uh -huh. or not too much back. Okay. And what have you learnt about yourself? Very little. <laughs> <laughs> Is that good or bad to have learned very little? <laughs> well, we say uh, when at a certain age, now he's becoming really wise in German, you know, wise. Wise, yeah. wisdom. Wise. Yeah. Mm. And I, I don't think that I'm wise at all. <laughs> you know, so. In that movie you were working with Fritzi Haberland. With or, Fritzi, Fritzi Haberland. Yes. She's a remarkable young yes, German yes. actress. What, what was that like? Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Just, she you was know, so, so alive and so, so and real and, 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 and pleasant, you know, she's, and, and funny. Mm. She's a remarkable actress. I, I really like her very, very much. Yeah. I mean, I, I've seen her on the stage playing theatre here in Berlin. Yes, she's never really, seen really good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah. excellent. Um, what's, uh, how good are German movies these days? Are German movies doing well? I mean, you can look back on a long career, you can yes, compare. Yes. Yeah? Where are we so now? I've seen many ups and downs. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes even too much of optimism, you know, that they said, well, now the German film made it to be or to become international. And, so, and I always said, calm down. Mm -hmm. Stay where you are. Mm -hmm. Don't um, be too optimistic about it. Sometimes there are good, uh, uh, certainly a generation, a new generation comes and they make 
better films as they used to, to do before. And uh, so the film business, mm -hmm. well, it's not a very great business in uh, Germany, in Germany, you know, the film. And it cannot be. So German films are always limited, you know, to, to Germany mostly. So... Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting, we, we talked about the tin drum and, and some of your other films have been really very much about German history. The films in Germany that are very successful outside Germany are also about German history, like Aftermath with the, the film about Hitler, yes. uh, Downfall, I mean, the film Downfall, about Hitler, yes, uh, yes. The Lives of Others, uh, oh, yes. you know, Goodbye Lenin, all these movies have been made. Is that because Germans think too much about the history or is that because they're the only films they can sell outside Germany? I don't know if they uh, think about that. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't think so. That they think about uh, international. They, yes, they think about international success now. But uh, um, I think um, there is uh, n not a very precise uh, way, you know, to. Uh, mm. There's no formula. Yes, there's no formula. No formula. We have to do this to become successful or so. Mm. They, they are all very uh, personal, individual filmmakers and mm. they make their films and, and I think that's good so, that's good for, in, for Germany, for France, for Italy and so forth, mm. but, uh, m and very rarely for the international market. Okay, okay. Uh, Mario Aldorf, you don't just, you're not just an actor and an entertainer, you also write, yeah? You write books, yeah? Why do you write? Well, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm not a writer, you know, I'm... Um, You're a very I, good writer. I'm, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm, I've always considered myself, um, a, let's say, a discreet uh, storyteller, you know, and I just wrote, you know, my stories, mostly real stories, or some invented as well, you know. Mm. So, but I'm not, I'm not really a writer, I'm, I'm a storyteller. OK, let's stay on books now and have a look at a man who wrote one of the most influential books in history. The name of the book is Das Kapital and the author, Karl Marx, who uh, not until that long ago was viewed by many people as, a, I suppose, a largely discredited political philosopher. But the global financial crisis has put Marx firmly back on the agenda. Karl Marx. His monument in Berlin is impossible to overlook. But does the philosopher, economist, and social theorist still have anything to say to us today? Karl Marx? Karl Marx doesn't really mean anything to me. I don't know him. I think we've gotten over that, to be honest. He's got something to do with communism, right? Karl Marx? Communism. Communism? No, that doesn't ring a bell for me. I don't think one needs to read Karl Marx today. Because everything connected with it went wrong. So, is Karl Marx outmoded for all time? No, says Terry Eagleton, a British Marxist literary theorist and critic. He wishes more people realized how timely Marx is. Simple ignorance. People don't read Marx. They see him, they, 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 they know something of a stereotype of his work. You know, it's like somebody who's somebody saying, what was the name of that guy? Freud. Oh, the man who believed everything was sex. Yeah? It is literally as crude and vulgar and reductive as that. When in the economic crisis, the capitalists themselves are talking about capitalism again, says Eagleton, then they have a problem. And if Marx was anything, than a critic of capitalism. That's the subject of Eagleton's book, Why Marx Was Right. But I think that's part of what Marx gives us today, a recognition that we have a system, that it has certain internal conflicts, that it's never able fully to master or resolve those conflicts, and therefore that we need to look in other directions. But those who lived in communist East Germany feel they've seen enough of that other direction. They acted as if they'd already created an ideal world, and it wasn't ideal, you know. Just look at East Germany. There have been lots of attempts, but it always failed in practice. So why doesn't it work? Because people are very egoistic. 
the unpredictable human factor. Nonetheless, Marx provides a precise analysis of the system that is now in crisis. His recommendations weren't very concrete, but you can read that analysis in the 78,000 pages of the complete works of Marx and Engels. Perhaps you'll come to the same conclusion as Terry Eagleton. Oof, Karl Marx, yeah? Das Kapital. Yeah, do you have a copy of Das Kapital on your bedside? Yes. You do? <laughs> Uh, not, I mean, maybe not uh, at the time, not at bedside, no. But, uh, but I you have a copy, yeah? Yes. Have I, you read the book from cover to cover? No, no. certainly not. Certainly no. not. There are very you know, few books I have read to, uh, to the end. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you are very interested in Karl Marx. Yes. But, but actually what I'm, I was interested in in telling a story, a very short and interesting story about the, um, Karl Marx's last year mm -hmm. of his life, you know, which was in 62, uh, when he made a, a trip to Algiers. He made a trip to, to Algiers? Al Algiers, yes. I didn't know that. Uh, it's yeah. interesting because at the time he was very sick already, you know. We had pleurisis, uh, how do you call this? Yep, you know? yep. And... Um, so Engels said, you have to, you know, to write the second part of Capital. So you have to write and go. Uh, but this year, uh, the south of France is bad weather. So go to Algiers, where it's good weather. It was actually just the opposite. It was good, good weather in, in Monte Carlo <laughs> and Nice and, uh -huh. and not in Algiers. So, but it, it's, it was quite an interesting personal story and experience, especially with the... Uh, his encounter with the Arabs, with uh, Arab uh, philosophy and politics, and their, for instance, that they do not have um, private uh, property. Property. Yeah. Only communal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. property. Yeah. This was very interesting, in, and in, and uh, so I think Marx at the time was more interested in in this world, new world for him. He never travelled actually, you know. Uh, he, he, he only knew Germany. This is England, why I'm surprised England, that you're and, telling uh, me he went yes, to North, Af yes. uh, North Africa. I didn't that, know this. It was the first yeah. time. Yeah. And, he, and he spoke Russian, and he was never been in Russia. He spoke uh, Spanish, never been in Spain. Mm. But he knew, knew pages by heart, Cervantes and all, these, and all the big uh, French authors and Russian authors, you know. Mm. He was a, a big brain. He had a fantastic, intelligent man, he really was. Mm. And you would like to have played this role? I would have liked this very... It's got, you've got the beard. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I've made even tests, you know, with, uh, with, photo, with photos, and uh, it could have, done, could have done all right, let's say. Mm -hmm. But um, there's a little chance, you know, that it, has, that it will be done. Mm -hmm. Because there's still some resentment, you know. Uh, the, the people are interested, they say, oh, that's interesting, but then you say, to do it and to give money and pay money for it. No. Mm -hmm. But it, it could still happen because now Karl Marx is suddenly much more relevant at yes. the moment. People and are it, suddenly, it, as we yes. saw on the report. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, um, it's a pity that we don't do it. But they still, they will do, uh, television will do uh, this kind of... Um, um, movies about his life his, his, uh, and his entire life, you know, and exactly. as a young man and so forth, which I'm not uh, mm. doing anymore. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever been to a demonstration in your life? No. No? <laughs> no. Do no. you... Do you uh, go on, you're going to say... I don't, I don't believe very much in demonstration. You know the one, you know, <laughs> of the... How do you call the... Uh, people without a job, you know, they demonstrate, mm. you know. Unemployed people. Uh, unemployment uh, um, demo, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, they, and there's uh, a man talking to some of these and says, look, uh, I have work for you. Here's my card, call me, come to see me, I have work for you. And this man says, why me? There are so many, <laughs> you know. I don't, uh, believe, okay, okay. I don't believe very much in demo demonstrations. Let me ask you this. You've, you, you've, um, we're going to talk about where you come from. Yeah? You've lived in lots of different parts of Europe. Yeah? Yes. Is, uh, because a lot of people, when we talk about Karl Marx, they think about sort of utopias. Is Europe, for you, a utopia? Is Europe where you live rather than one individual country? 
Well, I, I always considered myself European mm. because I, I was born in Switzerland. I grew up in Germany and lived for many, many, 40 years over here in Italy. And I always thought that I was as a European, mm. not as a German as much as a, a German or Italian or whatever, you know, and or French. Uh, so I, I always thought from the beginning that uh, the idea of Europe was a very good idea. Okay. Karl Marx, who we've just been talking about, was born in the city of Trier. It's located uh, close to Germany's border with Luxembourg and France uh, in the state of Rhineland-Pfalz in Germany's west. It's just up the road from where Mario Adolf grew up. The name of the region is the Eiffel region. As we find out now in our next report, it is a lovely part of the world. Water in all its forms is typical of the Eiffel region in western Germany. A common geographical feature here are flat crater lakes called Mars. They reveal the origin of the region's mountains, volcanoes. The greatest concentration of Mars is around the town of Daun. They formed almost 20,000 years ago. Among the Eiffel's architectural treasures is Elf's Castle. The castle's proud owners are the Von and Sue Elf's family. They don't live in the castle, but they look after it and keep it open to the public. The Benedictine Abbey Maria Lach in the Eastern Eiffel is the most impressive of the many cloisters in this Catholic region. It was founded in 1093 on the shore of Lacher Lake. Halfway between Maria Lach and Elz Castle is Mayen. With almost 19,000 residents, it is one of the region's biggest towns and is also called the Gateway to the Eiffel. About 25 kilometers west of here, the Eiffel doesn't seem quite so tranquil. In season, the Nürburgring, a Formula One racetrack, is not restricted to professional drivers. Anyone with a license can go for a drive on it, including on the notorious Nordschleife, the oldest part of the track, which is also known as the Green Hell. But for the most part, the Eiffel is serene. The population density is only 115 people per square kilometer, which is low for Germany. By comparison, Berlin has almost 4,000 people in the same area. It was very interesting at that, on that report, looking at Mayen. Yeah? Yes. Just explain to us for, for why, it, why this town is so important for you still. I mean, you've lived all over the world, but Mayen is your home, is Heimat. Yes, that's Heimat for me. And then you, you've uh, only one. Uh, actually, I think you don't, you don't have two. Uh, and, and, and I look for my uh, uh, other uh, home yeah. in Italy, and I didn't really find it in Calabria. Oh, that's... I liked it, it was interesting, yeah. but I feel very strongly, and I'd always say your Heimat is there where you grow up, where you hear the first children's songs, where you have your first love, mm -hmm. where you have your first school mm -hmm. days and so forth, you know, that's, that's what, what stays. Remains. The, the, I mean, it was a very tough time for you, yes. your child. You were in an orphanage for a number of years. Yes. And it was not, it was a difficult place to be. Yeah, well, yes, it was not easy, but uh, I, I don't know that I had really a trauma and really, uh, that I really suffered. Uh, uh, I, I think I didn't. Mm. No. My mother kept me away from all trouble, you know, in a way. Your mother was very, very, very important for yeah. you. Yes, yeah? yes, she was a very strong woman. You, you know. wrote this book, you dedicated this book to her. Right. That's a, that's a, it's a wonderful thing to do. But I still have to ask you why. Why did you write this book for your mother? It's a good question. I, um, because I know she wouldn't have liked it, you know. Uh -huh. Yes, because, well, that was her life and she was, she didn't want to, that anybody knew about her. When I wrote my first book, she, she didn't want me to, to tell anything about her, to mention her. And when she died, or before she died, she said, uh, I just don't want to, uh, I want to disappear. I don't want to exist. No grave, no, no, 
just, you know, spread into the sea. That, 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 that's what she wanted, you know. She wanted to, not to be there. Mm. Nobody should know about her. So that was her life, you know. Mm. So there, I had a big problem, you know, uh, writing about her. But uh, still, I must ask the question, why? Why did you write it? What was the important... What was the feeling? You had an itch somewhere. Something inside you yes, said, yeah, you yeah, must exactly. write it. I th it, was, it was, I think... Uh, um, in a way that she was not right about herself, you know, that she, want, that she was nothing, that she didn't want to be anything, you know. Mm. I wanted her, you know, to, to treat her, not all, always in a very, very nice way, you know, a, but very seriously and, and to give her the place she uh, really deserved. That's a, a great thing to do, yeah. You said... Somewhere, um, I, I don't regret growing up without a father. And yes. then you said something else, yes. which I thought was very interesting, and I'm going to read it to you now. You would like to have had somebody who said, who would show you the way, yes. who would say, do this, do that, yes. don't waste your time with this. Right. You would like to have had a mentor. Yes, yes. And maybe that I did not uh, see the normal role of a father as that. The normal father, the fathers I knew were not like that, you know. But, uh, and, and this kind of father I did not miss. Uh, the, just the, the father who was there, you know, as the, you know, this, this somebody who tells you what, what not to do. Yeah. I wanted maybe somebody who tells you what to do, yeah. which book you, 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 write, you, you read, and, and, and so forth. That, that's what I thought. And I, that's what only I realized later that I thought that I did not have somebody who said, who took me by the hand, as we say, you know, go there, read this, go there, see this, learn this, you know. You were left to yourself. Very much so, yes. My mother worked, she had mm. to work, and, uh, she, and there was not much place for education, and or for, uh, I didn't, I always had to do it myself. She said, if you learn, uh, yeah, okay, it's okay, then you go on high school and so forth, and if not, uh, you become a butcher. <laughs> Mario Adolf, I think you have done a very, very good job with what you were given. That's my feeling. Yeah? Thank you. We're going to move on to the, the quiz at the end of the show. I give you two alternatives, you give me an answer. Yeah? Oh, I can hear the music. Who do you find more interesting, the good guys or the bad guys? Bad guys. Wonderful. <laughs> We've solved that problem now. That's all we have time for, I'm afraid, with Mario Ardoff. What a life and what a guest. If you'd like to find out more, then do read my blog on the Talking Germany website. And if you've enjoyed the show as much as I have, then come back next week. Until then, bye-bye and tschüss.